I don't think Holly's uh, BBC graph had that post-lunch sleepy lull <laughs> in it. So hopefully, not too many of you have got that. And hopefully, my picture-infused presentation will keep you awake uh, if you do. Uh, I'd like to start, just to check those of you who are awake, start with a, a, quick, a quick quiz. What do you think the following things have in common? Post-it notes, chocolate chip cookies, tea bags, microwave ovens, lollipops, crisps. Are you getting hungry now? Again? Paracetamol, or penicillin, sorry. Teflon, crowdsourcing, language subtitling, and solar-powered maternity wards. Just shout it out. What do you think those things might have in common? There's a free copy of my signed book for the winner. It's absolutely worth having. OK, well, one of the speakers got it first. That's a, that's a cheat. Who got it out of the, OK, find me later, and I'll give you the book. Um, you're right, actually. They were all accidental inventions. Now, I'm not over keen on the word accident, because that implies luck. And all of those people actually worked very hard to invent something they didn't intend to invent. The fact they ended up with something different didn't really matter. Uh, the fact is they actually they pivoted and they saw a new path and they went down that path and in many cases produced something potentially more meaningful and impactful than they ever would have done if they'd stuck to the original route. If we just backtrack two or three of those examples a minute, I'll give you three examples of some technology social innovation which I think falls into this kind of serendipitous, accidental, reactive response to things. This is Eric Hurstman, a, a friend of mine from... Uh, from Kenya, He's, uh, spent a lot of time in, in Africa. Uh, Ken, uh, Eric runs the iHub in Nairobi and Ushahidi and a bunch of other organizations. Eric and his friends in 2008, most of them were out of, out of Kenya, they were spread around the world, and suddenly this happened, the 2008 Kenyan election crisis. The elections went bad, took everybody by surprise, nobody saw it coming, violence, murder, destruction, social disorder, it was, it was shocking to them and shocking to everyone else concerned. But being on the outside, they noticed that only news and information from Nairobi, Mombasa, the main sort of population hubs was getting through to the press, and there was a lot of stuff happening in other areas. And they wanted that to be captured. So they created a map over three, three or four days and called it Ushahidi, which is witness in Swahili. It's one of the first examples, really, of, of crowdsourcing, that you could submit an email or tweet or text or fill in a web form to report something that was happening where you are, and it would go on this map, and it would visualize the state of the election crisis so that once it was all over, people knew what had happened where, so reconciliation would be possible, and, and so on. The really interesting thing with Ushahidi was that it wasn't planned. It was reactive. They had no money. They had no five-year plan. They had no permission in fact. But something happened, and it stirred them to action. And today, Ushahidi is used in 130, 140 countries. It was central to the Haiti earthquake response. And I think tomorrow, Patrick Meyer is going to be talking a bit more about crowdsourcing, and he may well talk about that there. This is another friend of mine. This is Bridge Kathari. I met him at Stanford University. He was the first man to get money from Google.org in about 2007, which I always thought was amazing for me anyway, because Google.org had lots of money and wasn't giving much of it away at that time. Bridge was sitting in his friend's apartment in New York one Saturday night. They were drinking beer and watching pizza, uh, eating pizza. And they're watching this film, Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown. I have no idea how good the film is. Who's seen the film? A few people. OK. Is it good? OK, it's a good film. It's a Spanish film, and the subtitles were in English, as subtitles normally are. Subtitles are in a language that you don't that translate something you don't understand into something that you do understand. But Bridge and his friends were all trying to learn Spanish at the time, and Bridge casually mentioned during the break, what if the subtitles were also in Spanish? We could hear and read, and it might help us with our Spanish. And what if Bollywood? was to put all the Hindi films and music videos, all the words on the screen as well, so all those kids that read along and sing along and play along with the movies could actually follow the dialogue, and would it help them to learn to read? So he created this thing called same language subtitling, which you know, kind of goes against the original thinking of subtitles. But over a period of years, he convinced the Indian broadcasting authorities to put same language subtitling on films and music videos. Today, in the region of 300 million Indian schoolchildren get their early taste of literacy and reading 
because of same language subtitling. 300 million. It's an incredible number of people. And again, no money, no real plan, no permission, just something which cropped up, which he thought had great potential, which he decided to act on, and he took it all the way through and did some pretty amazing things. Any government, any international aid project which touched anywhere near 300 million people would be absolutely thrilled, let alone someone like him, where the idea just started so casually. And then the final example, this is Laura Statchel. Uh, Laura is a maternal nurse in the US, has her own practice. Most of the time, you know, the birth is, is a joyous one, there's no problems, the baby's born, everyone's healthy, everyone's happy. But for some research she was doing one year, she went out to Nigeria, and she was in a maternity hospital, and it was about two o'clock in the morning, and she walked into the ward, and she saw this. Now this is the main nurse's station, there's a gas little kerosene or gas lamp there. Around that desk is about 20 or 30 women with their babies, and they're all in the beds, and you can't see them because there's a power cut. There's no power. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing if nothing's really happening, but if a woman has spent a day, maybe a day and a half, struggling to get into the hospital, walking long distances, has severe complications of pregnancy, she goes in and needs an operation and you have this, they can't operate. Laura saw nurses holding their mobile phones in their mouths just to get a glimmer of light to finish an operation, or burning pages from a candle. Babies and women were dying in front of her eyes because there was no light. And it deeply, deeply moved her that in the 21st century, with all the technology innovation that we have, and all the excitement around health, and all the amazing things we can do now, that people were dying in the dark when there was absolutely no need. So she went home, and with her partner, they developed this thing called the solar suitcase. You put it outside in the daytime, it has batteries and various adapters and things, it charges up. And then at nighttime, you bring it in, and if you need to operate, you've got light. If someone's being operated on and the power goes, you just switch it on and you have light. And it's a very, very simple solution to a really quite horrific problem. And today there are solar suitcases being used in a hundred odd countries all across the developing world. And again, you see the theme developing here. No money, no plan, no permission, just seeing something which really she felt she needed to respond to because nobody else was. And it, and it just staggered her. Uh, these stories and a few more are in the book that I just uh, waved around there called The Rise of a Reluctant Innovator. The title makes sense when you read the start of the book. But all of these people were fairly normal, had fairly normal lives until they were deeply affected by something which then completely changed the course of that. And I think there's a, a very strong message in that. And you might wonder really why, other than these being kind of happy, good, good sort of stories, why they, why they really matter. Well, the reality is the people with the plans the people with the money, the people with the permission and the resources, actually aren't doing that great at fixing a lot of this stuff. So if we think about the international development sector more broadly, over 60 years, it's burnt $3 trillion worth of aid money. I think that's 3,000 billion. Is that right, mathematicians in the room? 3 trillion, 3,000 billion? Yeah, it's a lot of money. Okay, I mean, well, how many noughts? Nine noughts. Isn't it amazing that people are dying in the dark in developing countries, despite the fact we've burned through all this money and you have all the other issues and problems that are out there? Why are there so many problems still when these massive resources are available? And why is it taking people like Laura and Eric and Bridge and all those types who really don't have any of these things to go out and fix these problems? The argument sort of splits into two camps around aid, really. Some of you may know these two people. Who's the guy with the beard? Anyone know? Billy Stilley, he wrote a book called The White Man's Burden. It's a really amazingly, it's a bit of a rant in a way, but it's a, it's a great book about why aid is bad and why we shouldn't be spending money in developing countries and why we should leave those countries develop on their own. It creates dependency and all those kinds of things. The guy on the right is Jeffrey Sachs. Now, Jeffrey Sachs is the opposite. He wants more money. He's in a sort of Bono camp where we need to put more money into aid, more money into development. We need more resources, more, 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 more. But when you think about the three trillion, you think about the 60 years, and you think about the problems that still exist, you sort of wonder whether it's really a question of more, or whether really it's a question of maybe spending what we have better. And the whole debate in the UK recently about the 0.7% GDP going to foreign aid, it's a wonderful debate, but it misses the point that maybe we're spending 0.5%, but if we spend it better, we might be able to get the value of 0.7 without spending any more. 
And then the third sort of debate in all of this as well is uh, a guy called Paul Polak who wrote this book about business solutions to poverty. It will be businesses which fix these social problems. And actually, if you know, interestingly think about Twitter and Facebook as examples, and the great value and the great opportunity they've given people in countries who are living in, you know, under dictatorial regimes, given people the ability to mobilize, to, to have revolutions, to get out on the street, to connect. Maybe Facebook and Twitter have just accidentally done what all the development people and all the technical people out there have been trying to do for 20 years, but just done it better or done it by luck. It's not been a development project which created anything like Facebook or Twitter. So maybe business is the way forward. Maybe it's about looking at businesses and what they're doing and how those things can be adapted to, uh, to solve social problems. Uh, my experience with all of this, and this is something I spoke about in 2010 when I was last here, uh, is Frontline SMS. It's a text messaging platform, fundamentally, which you just download off the internet, you put it on a laptop, you can attach a mobile phone, and a uh, cable, and it allows you to run mass two-way text messaging campaigns from anywhere where there's a mobile phone signal. Now, you don't need the internet once you've downloaded it. Once it's on this laptop, you can take it to the last mile communities, take it to far out places. If you have one bar of signal, you can communicate with people um, by text message. Today, it's used in about 170 countries. And for me, the beauty of it is that actually it's a tool that enables the people that live closest to the problem, the people that own the problem, to actually fix it themselves. It's not about me flying around with this and telling people how to use it. And I think the future of problem solving with technology is to build more tools for people to take and use and not have people like me flying around the world trying to convince people to use cool stuff that I've built. A few quick examples of how people have used this. In Nigeria, a Nigerian coalition of NGOs monitored their presidential elections in 2007. It's the first time, it's believed, uh, any African NGO has monitored their own elections with mobile technology. And it was done using frontline SMS, and they had no money and no plan. The photographs they sent me was just lots of bottles of beer everywhere. It was just a crazy, crazy outfit, but they did something which really, really surprised much of the international community. In Zimbabwe, it's used by Zimbabwean NGOs to get news and information to and from communities where Mugabe is flattening houses, killing people, uh, causing human rights uh, uh, afflictions and all sorts of other pretty nasty things. It's opened up a communication channel for them as well. And again, this is Zimbabwean NGOs who are deciding how to use this and how to make this communication channel work. In East Africa, it's being used to highlight places where drugs which are essential for often children's health, are unavailable. Many East African governments say that if you need anti-malarials, you need anti-diarrhea medication, whatever it might be, it's, it's available, it's easy, you just go to the clinic and get it. Most nonprofits on the ground knew that wasn't the case, and you know, babies can die from diarrhea, certainly die from malaria. So every time somebody tried to buy a critical drug like that and they couldn't get it, they texted in, and it was mapped, and this is a heat map of places where you couldn't get the drugs that these governments said were available. And it's pretty hard to argue against the fact that there's a problem here when you visualize it in this way. In Afghanistan, it's being used for security alerts to field workers. You know, despite the, the troubles, the mobile phone networks are pretty resilient. They tend to generally work. A text message will eventually get through, and nonprofits are using it to fire messages around their staff to tell them where they should and shouldn't be going based on terrorist activity. For me, if somebody's willing to put themselves in a, in a danger zone like that and to try and help rebuild a country like that, the least I think we can do is build tools that can be used on the ground to keep them as safe as possible, and that's what's happening there. In Vietnam, Cameroon, Nepal, and Haiti, it's been used by communities to run their own human trafficking uh, alert systems. So when people believe that they're trafficked or about to be trafficked or someone's trying to traffic them or they want to spread news and information about signs of trafficking and so on, they use this system to do that. And again, they do it themselves. So it's done in local languages, it's context specific, and all those things. And in Malawi, it's being used to run rural healthcare networks. This particular one here, this is Alexander, who's running a rural healthcare network for a quarter of a million people through that laptop and frontline SMS, and simply sending text messages to and from community healthcare workers who are trying to coordinate healthcare over a very large area with hardly any money and hardly any resources. And it's done quite amazing things. Um, this organization has now become Medic Mobile, based in San Francisco, and they're quite an incredible mobile technology organization. The irony, though, for a lot of this is that this stuff uses SMS. All of this uses SMS, which every January gets written off in the year's prediction blogs. 
It's going to die this year. It'll be gone. It's not gone. Uh, it's, you know, it's still pretty strong. For me, when we think about technology, it's sometimes the simplest stuff that actually has the greatest impact. It's not the really, really cool latest gizmo. And I think SMS is a great example of a long-standing, proven technology which we should continue to use because it's relevant and because it's what people use in the parts of the world where there are the greatest needs. The problem we have is we have a kind of tech for development sector which is just damn focused so much on the latest, the shiniest, the greatest, the expensive stuff, which is, you know, in some cases, maybe half a month's salary for us just to buy these devices, yet we buy them anyway, despite the fact we don't really need them. And most of them come from places like this. We just get caught up in the occasion and we end up walking out with something that we don't really need. I managed to look at the Apple Watch and not buy one, because maybe I'm just slightly more pragmatic than some people, but I can't see any real need for it. But it looked lovely and it was great spinning that little crown around. But who really needs an Apple Watch, really needs an Apple Watch. And what we end up with, so here's a tweet from a conference about two years ago, which I, I managed to grab. I blanked the person's name out who's doing the talk to avoid them any public humiliation, but they're talking about how African farmers can use iPads to do agriculture. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to rural areas across the African continent or rural areas in any developing country. You don't see a lot of iPads. You just don't. It's, it's inconceivable to think that the people that you're trying to help would have iPads. And if they own iPads, they're probably doing pretty well anyway, and you should be helping people that can't afford iPads. It's just a crazy example of just getting very, very excited about something which isn't going to work, but sounds absolutely brilliant. We get in the scenario where we innovate for innovation's sake. My favorite example recently from an office I went to for a meeting is the iPad-powered coffee machine. Why on earth... Do we need this? Is the world really a better place because we have a coffee machine that you can order a coffee through an iPad? The iPad's now bolted down because so many got stolen. And the coffee wasn't that great. And really, what's wrong with the older machines? Right? Somebody's just thought, we can use an iPad for this, so we will. And that's, I think, sort of a reoccurring theme sometimes when we think about technology for good, that we do just assume that because it's newest and it's shiniest and it's great, we can do really, really cool things with it. So we end up with loads of really cool apps for Samsung Galaxy phones and iPhones, yet the people in the most need, in the most vulnerable positions in the developing world, they're still carrying these around. Try building apps for that Nokia 1100. That will show how smart you really are, because anyone can build an app for a Samsung Galaxy or an iPhone. It's not that difficult. It might not be useful, but you can build it. So, with all these problems, if we just stop and breathe for a moment and think, OK, how can we do the right thing in the right way and not get in people's way and step on feet and assume we have all the answers when we often don't? About six months ago or so, I published a thing called Donors Charter. It's 13 questions that you should ask yourself before you embark on any technology for development project. Very, very simple questions. Why are you the one doing it? Do you understand the problem? Have you researched that a solution may or may not already exist? In theory, if you can go through those 12 or 13 questions and you come out good at the end, you've got something worth doing. If you don't, then someone else is already doing it, and maybe you should go and work with them, because they're probably already halfway down the track. Let me get the clicker to work. So the message, I guess, for me, from all the people we've spoken about in this, in this short talk, is that for most of us, there's something kind of eating away at us. Maybe as we get older, we sort of think a bit more about, I wish I'd done that, I wish I'd gone there, I wish I'd pursued that particular dream. If there's ever anything that's giving you an itch, if there's ever something you see on TV or you see when you're on holiday in Nepal or India, and it disturbs you, it troubles you, it moves you, you don't have to turn your back on it. You don't need money, you don't need plans, you don't need permission to fix it. You really have no excuse not to do anything, really, when we think about it. And there are so many people in great need around the world that we actually need as many smart people as we can to commit to fixing these problems. Now, after all, Eric and his team did. Bridge did. Laura did. This Ugandan who wanted to build himself a helicopter. He did. These Nigerian schoolgirls who kept getting sick and tired of having no power at school built a urine-powered generator to power the lights. No one told them they couldn't do anything about it. They just did it. 
This guy who wanted to charge his mobile phone using his bike built this little charger. He did it. This Kenyan cattle herder who was sick and tired of his cattle being picked off by lions, he built a detection system using mobile phones and lights to tell him when cattle were th under threat from lions who had broken through a fence. He's got every excuse in the world not to do that, but he did it. And I think you can too. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. And um, it's interesting because um, he's obviously in the commercial sector. You know, so, so the problems you talk about, big organizations, you know, say you know, IBM or Microsoft, you know, the, and, uh, uh, there's, the history is kind of littered with large organizations that have all these wonderful people. They hire from the best schools and they have tons of money to throw at problems. And then they get eaten up ultimately by some upstart. You know, and, and, and at least I guess the system kind of clears itself out because ultimately I guess if you are a big dinosaur-like company that isn't innovating and, and, or is spending loads of money, that you've ultimately you get eliminated. Yeah. yeah. What, what's happening, I guess, in the in the social sector, where you know, like, I guess you know, I guess you would, it sounded like you were saying that you have large, well-funded charities uh, or or, or uh, you know, aid organizations that have received billions of of, of, of dollars, well, billions and billions of dollars, and over the years, uh, and yet seem to have had you know much less progress relative to some of the examples you've talked about. I mean, what's what what. What prevents them from kind of you know waking up and saying this is just a terrible way of yeah. of doing things? Well, in the in the business world, it's, you know, it's it's dog eat dog, right? If you build a product and nobody buys it, you go under. It's it's just a law of economics. Mm. And if you build stuff people don't want, then you know you, you should be out of business, really. Um, but the nonprofit world is totally distorted. It's about who sells their stories best. So there's no kind of there's no you don't need proof that people actually want what you're building. Mm. You just need to convince a donor that it's good enough, and they'll fund it. And if it's iPads for African farmers, they'll think, hey, that sounds cool. <laughs> Let's just fund that, right? Because it will look good on the website. So it's a completely distorted environment. So you know, in some countries, in India, there's, there's several hundred thousand nonprofits. An example I always use, uh, the, the white rhino in Africa. There are more nonprofits trying to save the white rhino than white rhinos. <laughs> right? So it's just a very, very weird mixed up world. So it's not about knowing and, and getting validation from your communities and users that you're doing the right thing, because you don't need that as a nonprofit, but a business does. So um, I, I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is in the nonprofit sector. In the business world, certainly, you know, Nokia, mm. the iPhone was responsible sure. pretty much yeah. for, for the end of Nokia. Yeah. They just didn't see it coming and had no response to it. Yeah. Um, that doesn't really happen uh, in the nonprofit world so, so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming back. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks so much.